I want to talk about Caleb. Caleb, uh, a powerful man of God in the Bible. And it's a lesson for us because it's men or women when it comes to this kind of lesson about following God wholeheartedly. So I'm going to begin with reading Josh in Joshua 14, verses 6 to 14. And then uh, we'll go back to where it all started. Can we put it on the screen? Yes, thank you. Joshua 14, 6 to 14. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephthah, of the Kenizzites, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God. By the way, that's the first time someone was called the man of God. The man of God at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. I was 40 years old. All the 40-year-olds, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions But my fellow Israelites who went up with me and made the hearts of the people melt in fear, I, however, followed the Lord, my God, wholeheartedly. That's the first time. Next verse, if we can. It didn't come up, right? Oh! Thank you, thank you, thank you. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance, in other words, your legacy, and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. That's the second time. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years young, And I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as victorious to go out to battle now now as I was then. Amen. Amen. Um, Then Joshua blessed Caleb son of Jephna, and gave him Hebron and his inheritance. And so Hebron had belonged to Caleb, son of Jephna, the Kesanites, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, again, third time, wholeheartedly. Obviously, God wants us to get this. Obviously, God wants to get this. I mean, uh, Caleb is mentioned at least six times in Scripture, and you first learn about him in Numbers, but the, the, the books of Moses go back and forth. And Caleb was one of the 12 leaders uh, that were sent out to kind of as a reconnaissance mission to, to see what the land was like that God promised them. God told me he was bringing them to the promised land. And actually, it wasn't so much that God wanted them to do that. It was the people, Deuteronomy 122, it was the people that said, we should go explore the land. See, the people were still walking by sight, not by faith. God said it, we should just believe it, right? All the songs we just sang, great song selection, guys. Uh, If he said he's going to do it again, we can trust his word. But the people then uh, didn't. They wanted to know what was waiting for them. Now, uh, think about this. They were delivered after 430 years of slavery by the Egyptians. They around That's Exodus 12. And uh, they saw, over a period of nine months, 10 plagues hit The Egyptians, not not the Israelites who lived in Goshen, but hit the Egyptians. They saw the deliverance of 600,000 men, not counting women and children, which were given from the Egyptians all the provisions that they needed for their journey. Gold and silver and cloths for the, because God was going to tell them how to worship and build the tabernacle. So they had cloths and linens and uh, all kinds of resources. And then they leave. But after they left for a little while, Pharaoh rethinks, says, I'm not going to let the slave labor go, let them go. And with 600 of his charioteers, royal charioteers, plus other chariots, they ran after them. And now uh, the people of God find them stuck between Pharaoh's army coming and the Red Sea. You know the story. And uh, then God split the Red Sea. And then the Israelites were able to cross, and it took all night, cross on dry ground, went through the Red Sea. And then when the Egyptians tried to go through it, God allowed the waters to close and they all drowned, giving them a great deliverance. And then now going forward, a cloud appears over them, covers them during the day, a pillar of fire at night. Every day, every night, they could see the the evidence of God with them. I mean, it was there. If you doubted, all you had to do was look up and it was there. And then God fed them with manna and quail 
and provided water from a bitter stream, a bitter brook, and then from a rock, and then he prevented their clothes from wearing out and their feet from not getting swollen from the heat. And it took about three months for them to get from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. And uh, when they got there, uh, God was going to spend, leave them there for about 11 months, almost a year, to start instructing them. Remember, they were slaves. They didn't really know godly conduct, so God wanted them to know how to treat one another. You read the book of Leviticus and you see all that. Um, God wanted to give them instructions about worship and what the priests were to wear and how people should just conduct themselves. And uh, then God told Moses to select 12 leaders, one leader from each tribe, the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, and send them on this mission that lasted 40 days, and it covered about 500 miles. Now, Numbers 13, 26. Can we do that, Numbers 13? Great. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at, the, at Canish Barnea in the desert of Paran. And there they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does... And it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. But, but the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and they're very large. And we even saw the descendants of Anak there, the Amalekites living there in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the, along the Jordan. I was quick. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land. There's the Caleb spirit. We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. There's confidence there. But the men who had gone up with them said, we cannot attack. Those people are stronger than we are, and they, are spread, among the, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had to explore. Bless you. Um, remember, these were leaders. These were leaders. And uh, they were over the 12 tribes. And even though Joshua and Caleb gave a good report, two out of the 12, the other 10 did not. They said, yes, there was a land flowing with milk and honey, meaning it was productive, it was fruitful, good for farming, good for grazing. In fact, when you read Numbers, it tells us in the 13th chapter that they came back with a single cluster of grapes that two of the men had to carry on their shoulders because they were so huge, plus pomegranates and figs. So the evidence was there. But these 10 leaders, who, by the way, were the majority, who, by the way, the majority, gave a bad report, and the people are powerful and they're huge and the cities are fortified and large and they're walled and the descendants of Anak, which were the tribes, giants in the land. Uh, we can't do this. We look like grasshoppers. We look like bugs in their eyes. That's what they were saying. We can't. We, we just can't. We can't do this. And realize this is a, less than two years after they got delivered. I mean, so, so think about all that they've seen God's provision. The cloud was still there. The pillar of fire was still there. And they're just discrediting everything that God promised them. God said he was going to bring them in. And because they felt they had to see the evidence before they went in there, um, what they saw was good, but what else they saw was bad. They saw the opposition. They saw the challenge. And they'd rather go by what the challenge they saw than the God that they were believing. They forgot what God has done. Never forget what God has brought you. The Apostle Paul, three times on my account, wrote in, this, in, the, in the book of Acts, or it's recorded by Luke in the book of Acts, about what he did. He did terrible things. He was a terrorist against Christians. And he wasn't proud of it, but he wrote about it to show people, to show others, look what God can do with a life that's given wholeheartedly to God. And, uh, and, and, and they forgot. Caleb didn't. Caleb didn't. David writes years later in the 103rd Psalm, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, forget not his provision, forget not his graciousness, forget not the things that he's blessed us with. Caleb didn't forget. The people did, but not Caleb. That's why it's, it's an, uh, an example of, I want, a, I want us all to have a Caleb spirit. What it is is a Holy Spirit causing us to give us the strength and, and not having a fear in us to do the things God's called us to do. You know, our, our memory of what he's done in our experience should empower us to do what God's called us to do. Just think about where he's taken you from. Just, you just recognize where, where he brought your marriage or where he brought your household. Numbers, he, 
Caleb uh, said in Numbers 13, we should go up and take position land, for we can certainly do it. There's a confidence. It's like if God is for us, who could be against us? I could do all things in Christ who strengthens. That's the attitude he had before it was even written. Caleb walked by faith, depending on God's promises, not by sight. Do you know there are over 8,000 promises in the Bible? Which tells me you could always find one. You could always find one. Caleb had a different spirit. Why? Because he followed wholeheartedly. Warren Wiersbe, who I believe is one of the best commentators, uh, you could get any of his commentaries, he's a great writer, said, outlook determines outcome. How you perceive something is what's going to happen. We just had the Yankees and Mets up here. <laughs> if any one of those athletes ever get up behind the bat and, and say, I'm going to strike out, you know what? They'll strike out. Any athlete will tell you that. You can't think that way. You got you to think positive. For us as Christians, we know God has our back. And wherever he takes us, we can trust him. And those 10 opposing leaders, they spread a negative report among the people, all the people. And it resulted in the people getting grumbling and complaining all night. Realize that those 10 men ruined it for the 600,000 plus people because they gave a bad report. They went from 40 days to 40 years, four decades. I mean, they started saying things like, if we only would have died in Egypt, and if only would I, whatever, you can fill in the blank. Be careful who you stay with. Be careful who you stay with. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes to the church in Corinth and says, do not be misled or don't be misguided. Don't be led astray. Bad company corrupts good character. I don't care if it's your family, your friends, your TT, your Tata, whatever it might be. <laughs> Bad company corrupts good character. It's been said that God got, them, got the people out of Egypt, but he couldn't get the Egypt out of the people. They wanted to go back. And Moses and Aaron, Joshua, Caleb, they were trying to reason with the assembly. But these 10 kept insisting that we can't do this. And uh, they eventually talked about stoning them. These were their leaders. I mean, one moment Miriam was leading them in the dance after they got out of the Red Sea, and now they're talking about murder and killing them? Man, it's, our heart is wicked. Who can, who can know it? As a result, God declared that they will not enter the promised land. In fact, they will wander 40 years in the desert, one year for each day that did not believe God, the 40 days that they went inspecting. Numbers 14, 24, my servant Caleb has a different spirit, for he follows me wholeheartedly. Listen to this. And I will bring him into the land he went, and his descendants, his children, his offspring will inherit it. When we follow God, parents, adults, when we follow God wholeheartedly, do you know our, gender, our family benefit from it? Our children benefit? Maria and I, we got saved in 75. I, I won't go into all of it, but, you know, we, we, we weren't raised in the church. We didn't have parents that went to church. When we got saved, we turned everything over to God. And then our family, our, 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 our sons are following God. I have my granddaughters here. They're following God. It's, it's hereditary. It goes on. There's a lineage here. Why? Because we said yes to God. Ex-drug addicts, immoral people said yes to God one day. And now I got two generations following us. That's God's promise for all of us, for all of us. It says, blessing on your household. Why wouldn't I want to follow him wholeheartedly? Why wouldn't I want my children or my grandchildren to follow God wholeheartedly, to be blessed by God, to receive all that God has? In fact, um, Caleb's daughter um, was in the land, and, and, and you know, you need water. Water is life. You to plant and to have a livestock, you got to give them water. And so she asked her, her father, Caleb, about having a spring. And he said, I'm going to give you the up and the lowest springs. I'm going to give you double what you asked for. And she married a man named Othendel, and, and, his, and he was called the um, lion, of, lion of God. He was the first judge of Israel. Talk about this being passed on. Amazing. That's why the Bible has, the Bible wants us to learn this. The Bible wants to teach us what we can learn by being like a Caleb who serves God wholeheartedly. That's what God's looking for. He's looking to bless us. Following him wholeheartedly even falls upon our children. And we need to walk by faith, not by sight. Not by sight. We need to lean on the promises of God, like I said earlier, all 8,000. However, however, you know what? Caleb had to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. 
He didn't cause it. God, he was a victim of circumstance. But he had to go those 40 years before he can go in. But God kept him. He was 85. To all us older guys, God's going to keep you. God can keep you. And the guys just go for the ladies too. I know you don't want to tell your age, but hey. 40 years he had to stay in the desert. And you know what I believe? I believe he had an attitude that he didn't grumble like the others. I believe there was something about him and Joshua that even though they were stuck in the desert, in the wilderness for 40 years, and they knew what the promised land had waiting for them, they didn't grumble and complain. They didn't murmur. They didn't murmur. Paul in a prison. The book of Philippians. Read the book of Philippians. It, it was written from a prison, sent to the church of Philippi. And Paul in a prison, in the second chapter, the 14th verse, says, uh, do everything without complaining. Everything. I mean, we need, the, we need the Holy Spirit in our lives in order for us to do that. Because it's so easy to complain about things, especially living in New York, the most expensive, the most crowded, the most dirtiest city in America. God bless all of you that remained. So we're not going to complain about the trains and the buses and the, the mayors and all those things. We're just going to pray for them. Habakkuk 2.3 says this, that the time is coming soon. The message or the promise will come true. It may seem like a long time, 40 years. It may seem like a long time, but be patient and wait, for it is because it will surely come. I mean, we all go through stuff. Everybody goes through stuff. Every mountain had a valley before it and a valley after it. We all go through stuff. Jesus said it. In this world, right, John 16, you'll have trouble. But fear not, I've overcome the world. That's our hope. We have hope in Jesus Christ that no matter what we face, he's going to get us through. Whether it's sickness, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, whether it's relational, whether it's marital, maybe it's the family, God's going to get us through. Even when it's not fair. Even when it's, even when it's not your fault. Even when the majority opposes you. And Jesus said it, and it's also recorded in Deuteronomy. Love the Lord thy God with, with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your everything, all your strength. That's everything. So God's looking for a people. I want us to be a people that we love God with everything. Are we perfect? No. Was Caleb perfect? No. But he loved God wholeheartedly. We can do that. The Bible wouldn't tell us to do that if it wasn't true. Suggesting, obviously, that we get people that don't love God wholeheartedly. We half-heartedly love God. We're half-baked. We love him on Sunday, but on Tuesday, well, that's another story because Pastor Durso, you don't know who I have to work with. You don't know the conditions I work in. Okay, they're probably not the best, but you can still love God wholeheartedly. In fact, you can live a life that, um, that could be an example. And, and let, me, let me talk to the fellas here. Ladies, please. And maybe you're a dad and you're because of things in the past you're not with your child, you can still be a good dad. You can still be a good dad. Because bad dads really mess up the inheritance, the legacy. There's blessings when you live wholeheartedly, but when you don't, well, there's consequences. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Resources has recorded this, and it says there's the consequences of a fatherless home, a dad not being in the, the life of a child that children are more likely to be poor, more likely to have difficulties with social adjustment, more likely to fall into drug and alcohol addiction, more likely to drop out of school, more likely to suffer health and emotional problems, more likely to have failed marriages. We need a Caleb spirit, guys. We need that kind of attitude that even though we may see the giants, we're still going forward. We're not going to compromise. We're going to stand for God. And I know, listen, we live in a crazy world right now. People are calling wrong right and right wrong. I mean, when I did drugs, I wouldn't have believed the stuff that people are saying today. Crazy. Educators, leaders. Like, what are you thinking? Really? You think I'm that stupid? I'm not that smart, but I'm not that stupid. Some of the things they're saying. And, 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 and they're not the majority, but they're the loudest voices. But you can feel like a minority when they seem to say what they're saying because they got a platform on, on the news and all of that, news media or in the public. Okay, the Spirit doesn't back down. We can do this. We can certainly be men and women of God in this fallen world. Certainly. I don't care how big the situation might be, how huge. We can do this. He asked for the hill country, which was a tough area, the tough uh, ter terrain. 
where the giants lived. <laughs> I like that. Give me the giants. Come on. It's like, it's like a Bronx attitude. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Different kind of spirit. He didn't have a grasshopper mentality. He had a Romans 8.31 mentality. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's the mentality he had. And just, you had so, so much time lying down. <laughs> Last few months I've been reading things. I've been reading Mark Twain. Like, who's Mark Twain? Huh? He had some pretty good quotes. He wasn't a believer. But he wrote this. He said, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. Yeah. I want to be a dog with a fight in it. Yeah, I don't care how wrong that sounds. I want to be a dog with a fight in it. I don't want a bucker. I don't want a coward. I don't care what people are saying. Be it friends, be it family. Our faith is in God. And we stand on biblical values and biblical morals and absolutes. And uh, we'll be challenged. We have been challenged. Things are being said all the time. I mean, listen... I've been around 74 years, uh, won't count the first 10, uh, but the last 60, I mean, I would have never dreamed we'd be hearing the things we're hearing today, never, never. But that's what we're facing. We got giants in the land. We got walled cities. We got people that don't love God, but we're gonna stand. We're gonna stand no matter. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, whatever. I love that. Nobody has a wiggle room here. Whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart, wholeheartedly, as working for the Lord, not for man. So when you work at the job, you're not working for that employer with all due respect. You're working for God. God provided a job for you. He brought, giving you resources to support your family. He wrote in Ephesians 6, 7, the apostle Paul did, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. We serve wholeheartedly because we got godly values and godly morals. Second Chronicles 6, 9. Singers, please. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed wholeheartedly to him. A Caleb spirit measures the challenges not by what they see, but by the size of their God, Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah, but I, I, I failed miserably. Well, I, I failed. I appreciate everything that my son said, but um, uh, there's things I, I regret. We all do. But thank God he doesn't treat us as our sensitive. Pastor Milton, what he shared should make everybody in this room, watching online or in this room, realize that God is for us. He's not against us. And nothing can separate you from the love of God. He's just looking for a man and a woman to serve him wholeheartedly. Can I ask you all to stand, please? Please. I love this church. I love this. I love, I love everybody that does things here. And this, thank you. Thank you. All right, all right, all right, stop. You're, you're messing up my sermon. You're messing up my sermon. Yeah, we love Jesus. Yes, amen. amen. But you came here today, or you, you're watching online. Let me just ask this question so that you leave here with such confidence. Is everything right with you and God? I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm just saying you're aligned with God. You're aligned with the Father. And, and if he was to come back today, we would know that where we would be with him forever.